No, no, I'm sorry, it's just way too easy. Let's just roll the opening. And what else could we do? We've been down this road so many times before. Will I ever learn the way to come back to you? The sun and sea is taking me, and now it is a part of me. I'm falling back to where I used to be. This must be you, it's overdue. Now I can see, I know it's true I'm falling back, yeah I'm falling back to you I can see you from a million miles away Things weren't always the way they are today if Well folks, we are nearing the end of our journey it's been a bit of a wild ride, and I have to admit I've been having a lot of fun with this, revisiting all of the Zelda games from my past, and replaying a few from the present time. However, now is the best part, where we get down to the wire, where we get to see the greatest game ever made, the type of game that was, that was so wonderful, so amazing, so revolutionary, that the mere sight of its trailer caused grown men to fall to their knees and weep like little girls at the very sight of it. I am, of course, talking about the awesomeness that is Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. Originally released on the GameCube near the end of its tenure and later ported to the Wii, Twilight Princess is the most recent Zelda game that has been released. And, quite frankly, it is awesome. It's a return to form after Wind Waker with more realistic graphics, darker storytelling, probably even darker than Majora's Mask, and some of the best character development you will ever see in a Zelda game. Link brings with him a huge arsenal of returning tools while also showing off some new stuff all over the map. The story this time around was more of a return to form from Wind Waker. It was much darker and more mature, but overall it followed the basic Zelda formula much more closely than Wind Waker had as we'll see as we go along with the plot analysis. Link starts from humble beginnings once again, this time as a goat herder, and in fact that's how the game starts out with, by herding goats, and he lives in a swinging bachelor pad somewhere in the middle of a forest inside a tree. However, his happy life is quickly interrupted when monsters led by King Bublin break into the village and not only kidnap all of the children and Link's horse, but also his supposed girlfriend. King Bublin then blows a horn which somehow causes a transport portal from the world of Twilight to appear and start bathing the entire area in Twilight. Being the badass that he is in this game, Link decides to forego trying to find reinforcements and instead chases after them on foot despite the fact that they were all riding wild boars. During this, he gets captured by something and gets pulled through a wall of twilight. It is at this point where the game's touted gimmick comes in and Link is transformed into a giant black and white wolf with green highlights in its fur. Hmm. Fashion sense aside, Link passes out due to the effects of the transformation and is pulled into a dungeon by the creatures of Twilight, and it is here that we meet his partner for the game. Tinker. 
The little imp here with a decidedly toothy grin is named Midna, and she is awesome. I'll get into her more when we discuss the characters for this game, but for right now, let's just focus on the story. She agrees to break Link out of prison, provided that he becomes her servant and helps her recover some artifacts that she needs. After leading him to an encounter with Princess Zelda, on which she expounds about how the entire kingdom has been enveloped in twilight, she warps Link back to the Land of the Light so that he can work on trying to get a sword and shield. And thus, it is through these actions that Link learns of his destiny as a chosen warrior of the Light, sent to Hyrule to try and save it from the encroaching evil. What that evil is, we don't find out for about another dungeon or two, but Midna's happy enough to give us a reason for it later on. Since this game is a return to form to the classic Zelda feel, most of the characters aren't really as well developed as they were in, say, Wind Waker. They remain very expressive, but they adhere more closely to the stereotypes that had always been set upon them. For example, Link is still the silent stoic hero, and you could argue that he was that in The Wind Waker, but he certainly had a lot more to him in that game, in my opinion. On the other hand, Zelda is barely in this game. Though she's still very important to the plot, she only shows up about three or four times throughout the course of the game, and each time she does, she has a very important role to play, such as the first time when you meet her, when she is the one who exposits exactly what the heck is going on in Hyrule at this point in time, and what exactly has happened to her as a result. One of the things that I really did enjoy in terms of villainry in this game was how Zant was portrayed. Zant is laid out to be our main villain, even though later on it turns out he was just being manipulated by Ganondorf, but the way he's built up is just brilliant. It's very comparable to the way Ganon was portrayed in the early Legend of Zelda games, how you never really confront him until near the end of the game. However, in this case, Zant does make his presence known several times during the game, and he's so casually cocky, and he makes it very clear that if they were to engage in combat at this point, he would be a force to be reckoned with. He's certainly a very intimidating villain, at least until you actually fight him, but I'll get into that when we discuss the final battle for this game. Of course, that leads me into one of the best characters in the entire series, which is Midna, who I mentioned before. Not only is she a driving force in the plot, but she's just such a great character. When the game starts off, she cares absolutely nothing for you, your world, or your quest. In fact, the only reason she busts you out is so that she can force you into being her servant, so that she can try and get what she wants, which is to destroy Zant for some wrong he did to her, which I'm not going to go into for fear of spoilers. She is a character that goes through so much change and development over the entire game that it's just simply amazing, and it's not even like... Tattle's heel turn, where she's just suddenly on your side. No, it takes almost the entire first half of the game before she finally starts even warming up to Link. But after that, she does prove that she does care for you, and it's a very slow-moving, very believable sort of development. She's one of the most amazing characters ever. Seriously, though, Midna starts out so twisted that she actually goads Link into obeying her by imitating his kidnapped friends, implying that they might be dead, or even worse. But by the end of it, she's actually willing to throw herself in front of an unconscious Zelda in order to try and defend her from Ganondorf's possession technique. While it doesn't really work well, it does show that she's willing to change, and indeed does over the course of the story. When talking about the controls in this game, it can get a tad complicated just because of the fact that there are two versions of the game, one for the GameCube and one for the Wii. And to be quite honest, having played both versions, I prefer the GameCube controller to the Wii remote in this game. It's not that the Wii controls are bad, in fact, all the footage that you're seeing of this game is from the Wii version. But the GameCube controller feels much more natural, and playing the Wii version, you can definitely tell that this was a port because, well, 
a majority of the tacked on Wii Remote things are just that, tacked on. The most impressive thing I had was aiming a bow, and you can do that with any other first person shooter in the Wii's library. So there's really nothing that separates Zelda from the rest of the pack. As I've said many times in the past, Link controls pretty much the same way he did in the last games, with the only differences being if you're playing on the Wii Remote Controller, which has you assign objects to different buttons, and instead of pushing a button to swing the sword, you swing the Wii Remote from side to side. However, things are a bit different when you take his wolf form, which you do throughout the game to solve certain puzzles. For obvious reasons, the wolf cannot use any of Link's weapons or items, so instead he has to rely on both Midna and his own powers, such as the ability to use his animal senses to see things that might be considered invisible, using his ultra super hearing to eavesdrop on people, using Midna to try and clear large gaps, uh, trying to dig into the ground to find hidden objects or to slip through certain places, or my personal favorite, talking with animals. Yeah, that chicken has some real interesting things to say. While the wolf is faster than Link in his human form if he's not riding Epona, the wolf does have the disadvantage of not being able to draw a sword, which is by far the best way to kill things in this game. In fact, there are quite a few enemies later in the game that are entirely invulnerable to the wolf's attacks and can only be killed with a blade.